All right, hi everybody. It's time for another Beatles uh, analysis video. I have with me my good friend uh, James Corbett, uh, who is uh, well. W first of all, we're gonna we're gonna do well. You're gonna introduce. Let's leave it to you to introduce the song. Let's do that. All right. Well, as people who are following along religiously with every episode of this series will know, we are going through each album of the Beatles discography one by one, selecting one of the songs for an in-depth discussion each month. And this month, we have arrived at Sgt. Pepper's The Lonely Hearts Club Band. Of course, the 1967 release from the Fab Four, who were quickly becoming the Psychedelic Four, I guess. And... Uh, Obviously, there's a lot of surrounding context to this, the Summer of Love and all of that we'll obviously get into. But for today's selection, which song will we go for? First, I want to note that at the end of our last conversation, we noted it was Sgt. Pepper's who was coming up, and you, intriguingly, you said, well, I'll leave it up to you, James, but I think I know, or you, you said something along those lines, I think I know what you're going to pick. What did you think I was going to pick? I thought I thought you were going to pick Good Morning, Good Morning because you're a fan of time changes and that yeah. that has that's <laughs> rife with that stuff, right? I, yeah. I got to admit that is intriguing, um, mm -hmm. but I did not choose that for this conversation. In honor of I didn't know it at the time. This is as we were recording your 64th birthday. Yes, so indeed. We, we are recording a conversation about Sgt. Pepper on your 64th birthday, so we are going to talk about that time-honored 64th birthday classic. If you're a Beatles fan, what else are you going to talk about on your 64th birthday other than Within You Without You? <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing, Vinny? What's yeah. going on? Uh, in my defense, I didn't know it was your 64th birthday today. I would have chosen that, of course, when I'm 64. Well, I'll tell you what. I didn't know it was my 64th birthday until yesterday. Um, <laughs> your friend told um, you. <laughs> yes, my dear friend, uh, Gene Ferreter, back in Maine. He's he's a uh, an astrologer and a great guitar, great musician, great friend. I love Gene. And uh, he texted me, and he, with his text, he said, uh, so, Vinny, is Paul going to serenade you for your birthday? And I'm like, what are you talking about? I don't understand, because in my mind, I'm turning 65. I said, what do you mean? And he goes, you know, when I'm 64. And I said, but I'm turning 65. And he goes, no, you're not. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So I can't be held responsible for the fact that we are not talking about the appropriate song here. I would have liked well, to have talked about that song. That would have been an interesting it, conversation, too. But. It's an interesting song. And, and you know what? This morning, you know, I have this thing of uh, on Facebook. I'll, I'll, I'll post, this is a song that was going through my mind when I woke up this morning. So I posted when I'm 64 and told the whole story about how this, you know, my screw up in memory, you know, how that all happened. And uh, yeah, so uh, funny thing. I mean, you know, um, I have an excuse for the lack of memory. The older you get, you know, the more you lose your memory. So it only makes sense. Exactly. You know? Yeah. When I'm 64, I won't remember that I'm 64. <laughs> yeah. And as I said to you earlier, I'm striving to be like Joe Biden. I just want to be completely, you know. <laughs> you yeah. know. Still got a decade to go for that. But anyway. But you know what? Um, by the way, I mean, right after when I'm six, uh, right after Within You Without You comes when I'm 64. Exactly. And that's an interesting transition to talk it's, about. Uh, it's a very interesting transition. All yeah. right. So let's... Let's oh. get into this conversation. I heard the motorbike in the background there. Yeah, the yeah, dulcet yeah. tones of Venice Beach. So today, in today's conversation, we're going to be talking about the differences between ancient Tamil music and Carnatic music and Hindustani music. We're going to be talking about the Swara, the Raga, the Tala, the Shruti, the Alankar, the Sangeeta, the Vajja. We're going to be going through the Indian solfeggi system, which we all know is Sa De Ga Ma Pa Da Ni. We're going to be going through all of this. And Vinny, go. Uh, you take it, James. I've got to take a break. And, and you just... <laughs> wow, you did some homework. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not any authority on Indian music whatsoever, but apparently you are. <laughs> I, can, I can sing the melody in Indian solfage. Gama pa ni ni da ga pa de pa ma ga. Anyway. Did you actually learn all this? Like in the no, I listened to the studio outtakes of George coaching the Indian players oh, how to do the 
No, it's it's like this, and he sings it for them in the Indian Solfege. Oh, that's wild. You know, by the way, uh, that that kind of training happens a lot in Africa. They don't they don't write music down on paper so much as they just sing it, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and expect you to pick it up through your ears rather than on paper. That's probably very good training for a musician. Mm -hmm. Totally. The African musicians I've worked with have been utterly brilliant, like scary brilliant. Um, so, yeah. Now, Indian music, uh, let's talk a little bit about it. I mean, this kind of... Um, when you talk about Indian music, it kind of refers to the thesis that I have that before the temperament of the scale in Europe and before that tempered scale became a worldwide phenomenon that every culture is using now, you can only have drones. You could have music that was a drone. So basically the music wasn't harmonically interesting. You'd had, you had to rely on the melody. Now when you have a drone, you could shift like, you know, let's say... I've got a D note here. Let me get this in focus here. So I could, you know, hit the minor uh, note. But I could change up the mode immediately without, without any problem because there's no harmony to bother me. So now... Now I went to the major. Now, so, from a European classical perspective, why does that, why, why is it fluid? Is it because the D is just the drone, so it just keeps you in that, no matter where you go, you're rooted to that D, right? Right, think of it like this. Like, in terms of Western scales, for example, if we think of the modes, and let's leave harmonic and melodic minor scales out of this for a moment, but if I think of modes, I, I could go D Ionian, D Dorian, D Phrygian, D Lydian, go through the whole list of modes, and then I have the option of playing D harmonic minor and melodic minor and and yeah, variants yeah. of those. Mm -hmm. So basically, mm -hmm. it's kind of anything goes when mm -hmm. you have a drone because you don't the melody does not have to conform to what's going on with the harmony because there is none, right? And uh, I thought you know when you mentioned this to me, I, I I remember writing back to you saying, well, you know, it's it's basically a one chord song, so you know, there's not much to talk about in terms of the Harm harmony movement, there's nothing to talk about, you know. So where do we go from there? We have to listen to the melody and figure out what's going on. Uh, a little bit of, you know, background is that uh, George uh, Harrison was having a conversation with Klaus Vorman. Uh, Klaus was the guy who designed the Rubber Soul record. He was a good um, buddy of the Beatles and hung out with them from the early days. Um, they, you know, as was the way of that time, God knows what, you know, they might have been imbibing, imbibing psychedelics or whatever, but it was very, very common in those days to have philosophical talks, the meaning of life, you know, what is all this for, that sort of thing. And uh, George was, I guess they were talking about, the, he, it was referred to as the, the uh, what was the word? I think uh, this wasn't the word, but it's good enough, the psychic space between people. And how do you bridge that gap between people, you know? So it's moving into a spiritual dimension. You know, when you go back to the 1800s, science and spirituality were very close-knit. And uh, they believed in those days in ether, you know, that there was an all-pervasive yeah. element in space called ether. Before we start dropping tabs here, um, can I ask a little bit more about the musical aspect of this regarding yeah. the raga. What is a raga? Yeah, ragas are, are there. This goes completely against the European mind and the U European uh, style way of like categorizing things and everything is scientific and put into a little box. Ragas are very interesting. They're melodic. You could call them, they, they move upward and downward like a scale, except the scale steps going up might be different than the scale steps going down, right? And and the tradition is you, whatever the ra particular raga is, you take that set of notes and you can improvise on those notes. So you can start messing around, but they must be those notes. So when you're ascending, you have to use that one set that ascends, but you do the different set. If you're going downward, you have to do the different set. And uh, ragas, much like the Greek modes, it goes much, much deeper in Indian music where they believed each raga uh, 
evoked a, an emotion. It evoked a mood. They have ragas for the time of day or the mm, time of year, right. you know? Yep. Um, so, yeah, that, this yeah, just reading back. from the Wikipedia, like, I'm trying to wrap my mind around this. It's like, each raga provides the musician with a musical framework within which to improvise. The specific notes within a raga can be reordered and improvised by the musician. Ragas range from small ragas like Bahar and Shahana that are not much more than songs to big ragas like Malkons, Darbari, and Yaman, which have great scope for improvis improvisation and for which mm -hmm. performances can last over an hour. Uh, ragas may change over time, with an example being Marwa, the primary development of which has gone down to the lower octave compared to the traditionally middle octave. Each raga traditionally has an emotional significance and symbolic associations, such as with season, mm -hmm. time, and mood. The raga is considered a means in Indian musical tradition to evoke certain feelings in an audience. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I, I'm not going to wrap my head around this in <laughs> in our 20-minute yeah, conversation. Yeah, it's a very, <laughs> very, this is way more than folk music. This yeah. is a classical music tradition coming out of India. It's a very strict discipline. Mm. Uh, some uh, Indian uh, critics, you know, claim that Harrison wasn't coming even close to the true Indian classical tradition, and they, they kind of got pissed off that he was culturally appropriating, you know, okay. at that time. Well, then know. I'll let uh, one of my resources uh, slip for today. Um, back in 2017, on the 50th anniversary, Howard Goodall, who you will recall did a uh, I think a piece for the BBC several years ago about classical music and the Beatles and whatever. Um, he did a special called Sgt. Pepper's Musical Revolution, where he talk, He did a deep dive on the musical aspects of some of the songs off of Sgt. Pepper, including Within You, Without You. Um, he went through that uh, Indian soul edge thing and showed some of the clips of George coaching the He's Indian great. Musicians. I love Howard Goodall. Yeah, yeah. he's very good. And uh, one of the aspects that he was talking about with regards to this um, was... The uh, uh, the different aspects of Indian music and how George was appropriating them. And he shows, for example, how a classically trained Indian singer would sing this melody, for example. Oh, and they, they show, wow. you know, with the, the Indian, with the, it's very ornamental, uh, you know, yeah. like that kind of singing, mm -hmm. um, which obviously George was not going for. George was obviously using a more traditional Western style of singing. Although using a modified Indian scale, I believe is the term that Goodall used. If that's the case, it might well be that this raga. Uh, I was going to talk about this. Like the let's not forget another aspect of Indian music is microtonality. So you notice on a sitar, you, you have movable frets on the thing. If you did that on a guitar, you'd find yourself like hitting out of tune notes. Things sound like they're not in tune. But to the Indian ear. Uh, they're so finely tuned to these microtones that they can hear the difference between this and this. <laughs> right? <laughs> I bent the string a little bit. That, Like, if you did that on a tuner, like an electronic yeah. tuner, you'd see the difference, yeah. you know? Five cents sharp or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now you can hear it. I'm exaggerating it a yeah. little more. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's somewhere in between G and A flat, but it's neither G nor A flat. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there's the element of microtones as well. In this particular raga, which is called Kimaj uh, Tat, Kimaj Tat, something like that. Uh, this particular raga, um, it, it almost became kind of like the, uh, the, the, how do I want to say, like almost a, a caricature Indian sound. And let me just play that scale descending. You'll recognize it right away. From uh, Strawberry Fields, can you show us? Can you hold the? Uh, can you position them? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. Yes. Right. Wow, oh, great! Got somebody <laughs> singing along. Accompaniment. <laughs> gotta love Venice. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta hate it. <laughs> mm. All right. So anyway. Um. Now, so what? Now, the, if you look at the Wikipedia article, they talk about it's a, a Mixolydian rooted scale. Okay, so let's do a little bit of music theory. Uh, I'm, I want to talk about a theory I came up with called artificial pentatonics, in which this scale becomes part of that set of categories that I had created called artificial pentatonics. 
Now, the first thing we have to understand is intervals. So, so let me uh, do a little screenshotty thing here. All right, so understanding interval types, okay? So here we have a do, re, mi scale. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. The distance between C and D, there's a note in between that on a piano. That's called a whole step. Uh, same thing between D and E, there's a note in between. But between E and F and B and C, there is no note, okay? So these adjacent notes are called seconds, all right? So you notice there are two different kinds of seconds. There's a whole step second and a half step second, right? So that's one type of interval of the seconds. But what we want to really concentrate on is the thirds, all right? And you can see here, let me see if this, oh yeah. All right, so between C and E, we have whole step and whole step. That's two whole steps between C and E. But then when we look at D to F, we get one and one half steps, okay? And you'll either find, these are called, these intervals are called, called thirds, one, two, three. From C to E is one, two, three. From D to F is one, two, three. So these are types of thirds. One is a big third, one is a small third. Okay, this is one and a half steps, this is two whole steps. So the smaller one is called a minor third, the larger one is called a major third. This is not to be confused with, um, with chords called major and minor, that's important. And let me move on to my next. All right, now this is an example of artificial pentatonics. Now what I have here is an A major scale. And I have the numbers of each step of the scale. It's the same as do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. Now, a minor pentatonic, um, if you compare it to the major scale above, I have an A to a C. That's called a flat three because that C is not C sharp. It's lower than. The D and E correspond. And then in the, in the key of A, we have the G sharp here, but the pentatonic scale, we have a flat seven. So we could say the generic minor pentatonic is one, three, four, five, seven, one. Now, why, what I mean by this is like the three can either be a, a major three or a flat three. You're allowed to have either one in this, in this formula, depending on the scale it's being molded off of. Okay. Now, the scale we're going to mold it off of is C mixolydian. So again, we have a do re mi scale starting up. Let's uh, let me move to my next one so you could understand what mixolydian is first. Um, all right, so here's the key of F major. F G A B flat C D E F. But if we start on the C note, we get what's called the mixolydian scale, which sounds like this. <laughs> come back to that in a second. So now here's our C mixolydian scale. Uh, now we're going to take our generic pentatonic formula, one, three, four, five, seven, one. We get one, there is no two. If we compare it to the C mixolydian scale, there is no two. Then we have three and four and five. There is no six. And then we have our flat seven. So now we get this sound. Okay, uh, and my last, oh, um, and so this is the Kamaj That Raga, what I call the Mixolydian Artificial Pentatonic, okay? Did well, that, did that well, register? Yeah, well, uh, it's, okay, so where's that name come from? That's an actual Raga. That's an actual Raga, okay. the, one, the one that we hear in this song, hmm. Okay. All right. Um, so, in other words, it can be equated to the Mixolydian scale. This is a silly question, but I mean, do you do you think it that appealed that sound appealed to the Beatles because they were so used to Mixolydian, <laughs> right? That's a fascinating point. Uh, that's a point I could go off on because here's the thing: it's like the seventh chord, the dominant seventh chord. <laughs> You can already hear rock and roll in that, you know. Right? That's blues. So you would play that style of playing, right? 
but I'm playing a minor scale. These chords are not minor at all, okay? They're dominant seven, which means they're based off of major. So we have this. So that's coming from American blues, which, as I say, is a system unto itself, right? But that's breaking the scale. These notes are not in the, in the C scale that creates this G mixolydian uh, thing. All right, so... Um, on the one hand, you can relate this to more like the Greek modes where you play mixolydian. Or you can play blues. Right? Hi, fellas. So, <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, I'll never be a professional podcaster because there's nothing I can do about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, in any case, but then then if we look at that G mixolydian and then we do the raga, right? It's interesting because that raga doesn't sound quite like the mixolydian scale. Is it it's the mixolydian scale is a little smoothed out. <laughs> And, you know, I was noticing that even if you you uh, put the, the sixth step of the mixolydian scale into that raga, it, it loses the quality. It just doesn't quite have that yep. the, the bite that that raga does, has. Does that raga in the classical tradition, is it the same up and down? I do not know. I do not know. I'm assuming it is because you hear it in strawberry fields descending. Mm-hmm. Well, and, maybe George uh, just didn't know, but it's, it's quite possible he didn't know. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's pretty much the music theory of it. You know, there's not much else I could say. We're talking about melodic steps, and this is that style. <laughs> And, I, you know, when I do, and I try to mimic that sound, you notice I do a special kind of vibrato. I'm not going... I'm going... I'm really exaggerating that sound in order to get that exotic Eastern feeling, you know. Uh, yeah, so there's that. Uh, but there's that. that's about all we could say. I went th well, Commenting on the music theory, my favorite part of the song, by the way, is the instrumental section. Mm, yeah, brilliant. I done. Yeah. love that. And, yeah, and uh, think about George Martin's role in that. Yeah, scoring the the Western Bingo. instruments to go with the Indian instruments. That's yeah. Bingo. you know totally. Mm. And then totally, they trade, yeah. and then they switch. Oh, it's man, brilliant. You know, there's always been fights over who is the fifth Beatle, but you know, I think there are different categories of fifth Beatle. Like like Brian Epstein was the business fifth Beatle. George Martin was the music fifth Beatle. No question about it. Like he really gave more dimension to what they were doing. Um, the fact that I think George asked for violins, but by the way, in, in uh, at least, I think the violin goes back in Indian music. I think that w that's part of their orchestra too, or can be part of their orchestra. Um, because George specifically requested violins for this, but it was up to George Martin to score it and to, you know, and I don't think George was like uh, George Harrison was like Paul in the sense that he'd come to Martin and say, play, "Have them play this or have them play that." I think George Martin came up with a lot of ideas. The call and response, da 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 da, and he he wrote in those the glissandos too, you know, mm -hmm. bow, yeah. Bow, yeah, yeah, to get yeah. that, you know, I, the creativity behind. That's one thing I love about George Martin was his open mindedness, mm. like. Okay, you're doing something Indian. I'll do my best to 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 you know to to give it that feeling yeah. that you want. Can you, you imagine know? any other producer at that time from the establishment stuffy you know British yeah. production system? I can't imagine anyone would have gone into that in that degree. Or American, you know, Phil yeah. Spector. Yeah. I don't no. think so. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's so. So well done. And I think um, from what I've read about the context of the song, um, George Martin and everyone else, well, George Martin specifically, really did try ex extra hard on this because they knew this was George's contribution to the album, essentially. Mm -hmm. This is it. 
So they wanted right. to make sure it came out well. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, I like the, uh, you know, when you think of Peppers as a concept, a lot of people really can't get this idea of what an album was like, you know, that you were forced to listen to track after track, unless you picked up the needle and skipped a song. But basically, you were meant to listen to these songs in this order. And I can imagine, I don't remember my first time hearing Peppers, but I could imagine when people played side A and then flipped it over to side B and suddenly they're hearing this Indian music coming out of nowhere. Yeah. It's like, all, yeah. What? I have this dream of introducing someone to this album and sitting there listening to it with them for the first time and mm-hmm. like stopping after the end of side one and saying, okay, you know, we've been on quite a journey. We've heard all this different music. Now, what do you think's coming next? <laughs> and then start side two. And it's like, what? Wow. Yeah. And, you know, ending with uh, a day in the life. Like, oh yeah. my God. Oh, my, what yeah. a record. What yeah. a record. Oh, man. Anyway, I think that's not um, my favorite Beatle record, but I, it's yeah, still I will, I will confess, I am one of those people who, for a couple decades, skipped over this song. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you know, it's the Indian song, yeah. But n- since I started listening to it with the 50th anniversary release, I'm like, oh, this is a brilliant song. Really. Uh. Uh, and, you know, one other thing that's really important to consider is, well, when George Martin first saw the sitar pop up in, uh, on Rubber Soul... He was having a hell of a time recording that thing. It's hard to get that resonance really full. When you listen, he matured over time with that instrument, and then you listen to Within You, Without You, and the recording quality is so pure, so pristine. The sound of the tablas, the tablas, the, the little drum, tabla drums, they sound like they're right there, yeah. you know? yeah. And that's another that's a, thing with the 50th anniversary release when you're listening to it with good headphones. Mm, it's so, yeah. yeah, it's really well recorded. Um, speaking of which, that brings me to the other musical part of this um, that's interesting to me. Of course, rhythm and meter. Um, mm-hmm. Getting into the Indian system of musical meter, um, which, wait, what is it? Uh, oh, yeah, the Tala. <laughs> I, right. So, uh, yeah, this is another thing that Goodall talked about. There are different types of Tal which are groups of beats, but they're, they're like, you're supposed to memorize them because they're not written down. Yeah. And they change and kind of evolve over the course of a song. And uh, so George was using a basic t- variation on the teen tall, which is the Indian, good, good all described as the Indian equivalent of four in the bar, kind of the four groups of four beats. Um, but then, uh, at the end of the first verse, there's two groups of five. And then at the end of the second verse, there's a group of five followed by a group of five and a half. <laughs> and, uh, Oh, I missed that. Yeah, wow. yeah, exactly. I don't even know what five and a half, like, what does that even yeah, feel yeah. like? I don't know. But, um, and Goodall was explaining, this isn't something that's in Indian music or Western music. This was straight out of the head of George Harrison. <laughs> like, wow. He, yeah. Okay. He just threw that in there. Well, yeah, the the Indian, they don't have bars the way we do, uh, you know, measures, you know. I don't know, you probably know a little bit more about it from your research than I know, but one thing I do know is that that instrumental section, the Indian bar, is 10 beats, all right? So you could call it 10-8 time. And if you were to clap your hands really fast, counting fives, da-da-da-da, uh, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. You know, we call that five, four here in America. But here's an interesting thing, because you and I discussed this kind of stuff before. How do you distinguish between six, eight and twelve, eight? You know, or, or like why is in twelve, eight, two, six, eights? You know, that sort of thing. I think the faster the faster the tempo, the more you have to go to the eighth note. So I would call this ten, eight time, you know. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And you can you can clap you can catch that. You have to clap fast because um, the again the eighth notes are moving quickly. And that's another uh, the, <laughs> one of my favorite moments is the pizzicato string bop 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 that come in during that section. It's just perfect. It's so perfect. Yeah, and you know that's George Martin. You know, no one other. So yeah. So I, you know, there, there's the time thing. Now I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, man. If you really want like really weird time signature from folk traditions, 
Greek music is the most bizarre. Greek music does like bars of 13, like 13, 8, and, you know, 11, 8, you know, really weird stuff. And it's like natural to them. They, they dig it. You can't dance to that. You need four on the floor to dance. You know? <laughs> All right, you guys, whatever. <laughs> Here's my new dance song. It's in 13, yeah. 8. What? What's going on? <laughs> yeah. All right. No, interesting. All right. So, um, yeah. But that's kind of that's kind of the sense. I mean, look, obviously, I am not an Indian music expert, but that's kind of the sense that I get as just the general philosophy of this, that it's this fabric of different elements that are there more to evoke certain feelings rather than let's notate exactly what you play here. No, it's exactly. it's more like, no, this fits in within a kind of a, a whole concept that's going on. Like a textural thing. And that's actually very similar to African music, too. Same thing, you know. It's more based on the drums than it is the the harmony instruments, but and the voice, voice and drums are really big in African music. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, well, another thing I want to look at with this is um, how many songs by the Beatles are one chord songs. I think there's only two songs. Well, this one and uh, Tomorrow Never Knows is not one chord. They well, yeah, to. but I have a feeling that Martin's stuck in that. Yeah, I think uh, they say John, when he first brought it to them, only had one chord. It was just one chord, yeah. yeah. So those are the only two one chord songs that I know about, you know. Technically, yeah, Tomorrow Never Knows is not one chord, you know. One thing they do have in common is that they're both drones, drone songs, right? Droning along. Um. And you know what I found interesting was Lennon called Tomorrow Never Knows, and you know the reason why he did that, he, because he didn't want to give it a philosophical title. He thought it was too heavy-handed, and he wanted to lighten up the mood, so he gave him one of Ringo, those Ringoisms, right? Well, also notice that at the end of Within, uh, Within You, Without You is laughter track, a track of laughter. And George specifically wanted that because the song was so heavy and philosophical, he wanted to lighten up the mood. His friends protested against it. They didn't like the idea. And he said, well, look, you know, this is supposed to be, it was originally thought to be like this mythical band is out on tour. And this is the audience having a jolly right after the song, you know. So it fits that was in his, with the uh, laughter at the beginning of uh, uh, Sgt. Pepper, right? Yes, indeed, it does. So, you know, that's all part of the whole spirit of that album, It really. brings in the album concept. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, that is interesting. And that gets, to me, to the heart of kind of... I know there is a contingent out there that it says George was the real genius of the Beatles. It was, you know, John and Paul, no, George. I can't get behind wow. that. Um, no, I can't it's, it's a hipster thing. You know, how can you be contrarian yeah. about the Beatles? <laughs> right, Either right, you right, hate right. the Beatles, oh, they never did anything, or you're like, no, George was the big... <laughs> I can't get behind that. Uh, yeah. But he, absolutely, this is a great song. Um, by the time we get to Abbey Road, I really do think what he was doing was absolutely as good as anything John and Paul were doing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. And there's early stuff. There's a lot of early there's stuff. There's a lot of too. promise there. I don't. I I know you like on uh, Revolver. Um, I, I, I want to tell, tell you. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, I, yeah. I am not so into that. Uh, I actually like Love You Too, but it's not yeah. within you without you. I mean, this is which was clearly, George's first foray yeah. into a fully Indian piece of music, yeah. isn't it? Like, yeah, yeah, I think so. And it it works well enough. It works mm -hmm. well on that album as kind of a filler track. But this is clearly a much more developed song. But when you get into the yeah the lyrics and the philosophy of this, here's right. the thing that I can't get out of my head. I don't remember where I read this or heard it, but I remember someone remarking that you can see the difference. George and John had very similar messages in some ways about universal love and all of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But George is sitting there on a cloud, looking down, judging you. Oh, you know, you, if only you knew about this universal love right. that I have kind of thing. It's yeah, very yeah. judgmental. John right, was right. very much, uh, isn't, uh, he's a real nowhere man. Isn't he a l l bit like you and me? John right. is very much more self-deprecating and I'm in this with you. And I feel that. Like, I don't know about their personalities and what they were really like as human beings, but I definitely feel that difference. John is the relatable person with a real 
you know, conflict, and you yeah. can tell he's he's dealing with this. George mm-hmm. is trying to be the the light of font and wisdom, and that kind of grates me. I can't get past, like, I get the idea, universal love and everything, yeah, beautiful, but it's so judgmental when it comes from George. Yeah, and uh, definitely, and also there's a line, are you one of them? And, and now, now he's talking to his generation saying, you know, the, the straight man, you know, the people, the corporate world, you know. Um, and I think that's one line that actually started to, like, get the hippies into the them and us kind of mm. mood, mm. you know. Mm. But, yeah, it's horribly preachy. It set the precedent precedent for uh, really kind of maudlin sentiments and hippiedom. Like, come on, people now, shine on your brother. Everybody get together. Let's love one another right now. Let's Let's just do that. I mean... I'd love that if that could happen, but it, it's not fitting you, for the You time. can tell how that turns into uh, Territorial Pissings by Nirvana. <laughs> I don't know if you if you know that, but they start with a mockery of that. <laughs> yeah, line. yeah, yeah. And you can yeah. tell why, because it is it is so corny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Or, or he ain't heavy, he's my brother. Like, you know, it, it was almost embarrassing. Like, it was really embarrassing. That's one thing about the hippies that, like, ew, you know. And my generation, which was late boomer, we, you know, when the hippies watched the shore, we came up and started saying, fuck you, you know, we were all pissed off. And I think a lot of it, we, we were bitter that the hippies couldn't do what they hoped to do, um, you know. But, you know, uh, speaking of hippiedom, I, I look at Sergeant Pepper as the flower the the flowering of the hippie movement, the psychedelic awareness, the very tip top of that flower. And after that, I feel like everything started going downhill. Summer of Love was the the pinnacle as I see it. And strangely enough, as if they planned it, you know, they're working on this in 66, but they released it in 67 for the Summer of Love, you know, it worked out. The Beatles were always just at the, at the, at the apex just coming right. out at the right time to be the mm-hmm. front wave of the apex and then moving on mm-hmm. and getting yep. out of there. Yeah. 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 It's amazing. an amazing phenomenon. I want to go back to, I want to go back to the beat generation and the proto hippies. All right. I have a theory that since Starbucks took off over the coffee house industry, we could never have a revolution again, just because of that, because we don't have cafes anymore. Um, it's an exaggeration, but I have. But fun I with see this. where you're going with that. The cafe was yeah. uh, actually a philosophical salon for many, yeah, many mm-hmm. generations. In yeah. fact, there's, there's a great video of Bob Dylan walking through this cafe, playing his early kind of. Uh, God, there were songs were so apocalyptic, and like he was kind of Saint John of the Desert in a way. Like, wow. Uh, but you know, there's people sitting around in coffee houses. You could people see people think of people like Allen Ginsberg or. Lars Ferlinghetti, and, you know, these guys were getting together in coffee houses talking about Zen Buddhism and astrology and Tai Chi and, you know, all this, like, really exotic Marxism, you know, at the time it was exotic. Um, You know, anything that was alternate philosophy, their minds were open and they they were talking about it. To me, that was a seed. These beatniks were, that was the seed that eventually gave birth to the flower that was... You know, the summer of love. Uh, the summer of love and uh, and and Sergeant Pepper and that whole thing, you know. But Vinny, now we have the modern version of that cafe. It's online and it's Twitter or Instagram mm-hmm. yeah. or Snapchat. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Oh. Yeah, there is definitely a palpable sense we have lost something vitally important to culture in the loss of these physical spaces where people congregate to have those types yes. of conversations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's almost cringeworthy to think about, you know. Um, but, I, you know, on, on the one hand, the Internet, the world of the Internet is wonderful, too, because, like, you and I could talk across the ocean, and it's that's awesome, you know. So it's great for exchange of ideas and research. People have become but their own But can you research. imagine if we were physically in the same space talking about these things? Totally different. different. Exactly. Different experience. Yeah, you'd be, you'd be pissed off at me for chain smoking for one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah. 
I think God, the, the stigma against cigarette smoking is so bad that when I have my students, the, the ones that aren't like, you know, my regular kind of buddy type students, uh, I, I don't, I won't smoke you know, uh, during a Zoom session. Right, 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 right. Well, maybe, uh, but, yeah, uh, I think maybe that's why the incense was so popular with the hippies. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it was to cover up the smell of weed. <laughs> Either way. Know. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, I want to uh, talk about the influence of LSD because that's really, really important to Sergeant Pepper, you know. By this time, Paul has taken acid. Now, I'm going to I want to talk about my experience with LSD. I, I took it a number of times in my life and I started at the tender age of 14 years old uh, tripping. And my first trip was fantastic. It was amazing. I'll tell you one experience I had tripping on my first trip. I, uh, I, it, the acid hit me just when I walked into my mom and dad's house and I went, Oh, you know, <laughs> so after a few, was that your like, plan? <laughs> that doesn't seem like a well-planned. No, trip. <laughs> no, it wasn't. You know, it was for the first time we we're going to do it. And me and my friend, my friend Danny picked me up. We we're going to see these girls in a, in a nearby town. And we took something, I think it was called white lightning and, you know, we were hanging out. And like, do you feel anything? I don't feel anything. You feel it? No, I don't. I don't feel anything. So we figured it was just some bum stuff. You know, some guy ripped us off, drops me off. As soon as I walk in the door, I see purple all over the you know the walls and everything. And I'm like, uh oh. My parents are watching Alfred Hitchcock. My dad's laying down on the floor as usual. My mom on the couch, uh, and they you know they were kind of like always in a hypnotic state by then. So I could like walk past them. <laughs> After a few hip mishaps, which I won't go into, I finally discovered the value of being in a dark room when you're tripping. I, I retreated to my bedroom, and I, I won't go into the visual hallucinations. But at one point, I realized I was hearing some music in my head. It was just kind of flowing around. And it was in harmony. In fact, it was in four-part harmony. And I immediately went, wait, who's writing this music? It was music I never heard before, you know. And then I thought, well, I must be writing it unconsciously somehow. Let me control it now. And I lay there for an hour controlling a four-part. There was no uh, lyrics. It was just voices going, ah, ah. And I'm hearing, like, loud and clear from the outside of my ears, not the inside of my head, I'm hearing four-part harmony that I'm directing and moving around and just composing. It was, I, if I took acid now, that would never happen to me. You have to be really young for something like that to happen. Did you record it? Uh, uh, maybe not. No, never did, never <laughs> did. Um, the thing about, uh, also, by the way, the, the hangover from LSD is remarkable the next day. There's a certain tiredness because it keeps you awake for a long time. But the experience I notice you have is that your heart is really open and you feel like you could look at total strangers and feel love for them for no reason. Like that kind of love that, that John speaks about in the word, you know, or all you need is love. That's what the hippies were reaching toward. So I realized, you know, this, this LSD had a profound effect on people. I began to have immense spiritual experiences. And I, I really, speaking about this in public is brand new to me. Um, I remember reading a quote from George Harrison. This is after I'd been steeped in acid for quite some time. And uh, I heard a quote from George Harrison saying, very kind of offhandedly, he goes, well, you know, God is within you. And I had a spiritual experience. People would think I'm psychotic, so I won't I won't go into the you know details of it, but I had an experience of God speaking to me like thunder, like thunder. It was like thunder everywhere, but it was it was silent at the same time. It was inside of me, but it was like I can't explain it other than that. And it changed my life. It changed my life. You know, um, there were specific words that were spoken to me, and and they stayed with me, and that got me on the spiritual path. The reason I bring this up is because what we find in those, yeah, the hippies are denigrated for being kind of, um, uh, what do you say, like irresponsible, you know, and they created the hell we're in. Mm, true enough. On the other side of it is that these people, it was okay to, to really go deep spiritually and to be, to be philosophical. And in fact, the Beatles taught us that. That's what they were telling us through their philosophical songs, you know, Tomorrow Never Knows and all this stuff. Like, 
think about reality. Think about what all this is about. You know, nobody, when you use the word reality nowadays, it's not exactly a popular word. So that must be understood. The whole part, all of us, all of us were changed by the use of this drug and the, the popular media, uh, you know, presenting all this psychedelic music and the thought that we had to, we had to look in a new way at, at reality and life and what is it really, you know? And that was, that's one reason why, look, I'll tell you what, if you have some sort of like divine experience, right? And it, it changes your life and you have to, I don't know, work on your taxes the next day or something like that, right? It's pretty likely you're going to say, fuck this for now. I got to do something else, you know, like I got to kind of bask in what I just experienced. That's part of the reason for the hippie irresponsibility, you know, because they were experiencing and it was mind blowing what they were experiencing. So I give them, I give them, you know, I won't give them a wide berth, but I give them some slack for, for that. Well, yeah. at any rate, it is important to put it in the context of the time. And this was a wide cultural phenomenon that was happening that mm -hmm. a lot of people were experiencing and relating to. Right, right. So, yeah, within you and without you, you know, life goes on within you and it goes on without you, whether you're here or not. You know, there are two meanings to that. Could mean inside or outside, but could, could also mean uh, when you're here and when you're not here, it goes on, you know. So, um, I would imagine that George ripped that from, you know, some Indian Vedas or something like that. Yeah. I don't know if I've seen specifically any commentary on that, but. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know exactly if that, I do know that, uh, you know, again, he was talking with Klaus Vorman yeah. about yeah. that whole thing. So apparently he composed it on a harmonium. Harmonium. After they yeah. were talking one night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very beatle thing to do to be in a social situation than suddenly pick up an instrument. And <laughs> a harmonium, no less. <laughs> Hold on, let me just go to the harmonium here. <laughs> but it, if you're going to make drone music, that's probably a good yep. instrument. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm sure in his mind he was uh, audiating a sitar rather than a harmonium. You know? Right, 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 right. So, yeah, that, that's uh, within you and without you. I, I can't think of much else to say about it. I think... Uh, we covered a lot yeah, of ground. We, we did cover some interesting stuff in there. Yeah, yeah. So I hope and people. And so now didn't fall uh, we'll finish. Uh, I will serenade you with when I'm 64. Oh, oh really? Maybe, maybe you? not. No. Maybe not this time. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll tell you what. Why don't you just like make a video of it and send it to me privately? This way. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll post it on your Facebook. Hey, look at James. What a dork. <laughs> Don't worry, he's not on Facebook. He won't see this. <laughs> you know, I'll just say this. I'm As people know, we're going to go through all the albums multiple times, forever, until we go through every Beatles song. But uh, I will say this in preparation for our eventual talk on When I'm 64. It's obviously one of those Paul Granny songs, but I like it. That's one that I can get behind. All right, yeah, and I just wanted to, yeah, speaking of Paul Granny songs, I did want to say one thing. When I was a kid, and before I had taken acid, I heard Strawberry Fields, and it scared me. It literally scared me, because I could hear the bending of reality in that song. And it seemed strange, but I still loved it, and it was still the Beatles, and, and I had to love it, because it was the Beatles, you know? And then when I took acid, I understood. It was like, oh, I get it now. But the thing I noticed about Paul is that at LSD is very existential experience, you know, it really is like you see things like that's why people can't eat on LSD. Like you go to a McDonald's and suddenly you're looking at this thing. Going, oh, God, ah, you know, <laughs> that's a dead animal uh, you know? or, or whatever it is. God knows. Mm. But uh, <laughs> yeah, these days it's not even that. What I, I loved about Paul was that, you know, the acid culture was heavy and it was you know, it was very heavy, you know, the philosophically and everything else. Mm, so mm. Paul did his best to say, hey, I'm still Paul. I took acid. You could hear my psychedelic stuff, but I'm still this happy-go-lucky guy, and you could still love me for who I am. And that is evidenced in when within you without you ends, all of a sudden you hear these clarinets come in, and it's like, when yeah. I'm 64, this yeah. happy little, you know, Paul lighthearted tune. 
So that's one thing I always loved about Paul. He was always reassuring, like, don't worry, guys, I'm still here. And, you know, nothing bad is happening right now. Right. You know? uh, a couple points to make on that. One is that that makes George Martin's contributions to what the Beatles did even more amazing because he did not share in the psychedelic experience. Yes, he did Somehow not. Somehow he kind of understood what they were going for. Yeah. God knows, he probably never tried weed even. I don't think I don't he think even he did. Tried. He looked down on it. He was not... They would yeah. sneak off to do it in the bathroom because they couldn't do it in front of him. So, And by the way, weed can be very psychedelic, too. It really can be, you know. Um, well, it, it can got to get you into my life was a weed zone. Yes, yeah. 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 So, here we go. Um, and the second thing, yeah, the, uh, the transition from Within You Without You to When I'm 64... It's just part of, yeah, that's that's the whole Sgt. Pepper thing. It's This is a trip absolutely anywhere we want to take you. <laughs> you and, don't you know, know what's what, coming next. That's another point, is that tripping is kind of like the ultimate ADD experience. Mm -hmm. One minute you'll be crying, one minute you're laughing, one minute you're hearing angel singing and the other you're you're hearing you know garbage trucks going off it, it's like and everything just kind of grabs your attention it, it yeah. it's not a grounding kind of experience yeah. but it does that's why they call it a trip you know the scenery changes yeah you know, i guess that's what i'm saying so pepper is a great great it's a trip you know yeah it's a psych actually yeah uh, um i was in preparation for this i was reading through the inevitable discussions of um people Sergeant Pepper, what would you? Let's put uh, Penny Lane and S Strawberry Fields on Sergeant Pepper. So, what do we mm. take off of Sergeant Pepper? What's the filler that we get rid of to put Ooh. them on? And inevitably, yeah. someone suggested take off when I'm 64, and I'm like, eh, no. Uh, Fixing yeah. the hole, I guess I could live without. Good morning, good morning. I could live without on this album, mm -hmm. but when I'm 64, I it, it has a place here. I think it is important. Yeah. That's a tough call. That's a really tough I, I, call. I, honestly, I'm I'm at peace with the fact that those songs are not on this album. It's an album. It's itself. It does its thing. It is only annoying for all the people who want to buy the Beatles albums, and then they're like, wait, <laughs> where's Strawberry Fields? Where's Penny Lane? Yeah, I don't have yeah. it. That is, that is crazy. But <laughs> Well, they slapped them eventually on Magical Mystery Tour, right? Magical Mystery where... Tour, uh, yeah. But like to really get the full Beatles over, then you got to go into Past Masters... Or yeah, the red yeah. and blue albums, or yeah, it starts getting. You know the way I think of uh, Penny Lane and and Strawberry Fields. I regard both songs equally. I love them both equally. Uh, I know you you're not a big fan of Penny Lane. I, I adore appreciate that song. it. It is a musically yeah. very very good song. I just it yeah. doesn't you know it's a little too yeah tweet. yeah sprightly or something. Yeah. Um, so so what I'm saying is like Strawberry Fields, Penny Lane, it's a little album. That's yeah. all. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little album. And of course, as everyone points out, it is the perfect Paul John dichotomy and you mm -hmm. know, here's they're they're doing the same thing, the same idea, childhood memories, their hometown, and this is what John does, this is what Paul yes. does. Yeah. And, and by the way, that's an effect of L S D too, is like when people take L S D a lot, they 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 get this nostalgia for their childhood. That that happens a lot with people. Happened to me, you know. Because um, I, uh, to be quite honest, I took acid as recently as about maybe 2013. I took acid, and it was like medicine. It was amazing. Most adults I know that that trip like crazy when they were young. They go, oh my god, I'd never, I'd never take. And I'm like, I'm gonna try it again. I'd be, you know, what the hell? Let's you weren't conducting happens. any four part harmonies this time, though. <laughs> no, it wasn't anything. I wish it could be that good, but no, no, it wasn't. Still very existential, very – I had some great experiences uh, in the later period, you know. But I did. It started to get me into that. I actually uh, – I had an experience of remembering a past life on it in the recent times. Hmm. That was amazing. Hmm. I, I saw myself as somebody else, but it was me. It was like, wow. <laughs> you were Alexander the Great's chief eunuch. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. No, nobody's ever anybody important. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Everyone's always like, I was Napoleon. I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah really? Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was born 210 years and one month to the day after Napoleon, I think. Something like that. That means. Anyway, uh, I think we'll leave it there for this time, huh? Can I pin one medal on myself before we leave it? Sure. Really quick, I want to put. A, first of all, I'm going to leave a link. 
I have a performance of myself during my more psychedelic looping days of me doing Within You and Without You. And because it was the only, uh, the only other Beatles, one chord Beatles song was Tomorrow Never Knows, I amalgamated Tomorrow Never Knows into Within You, Without You. I quote it later on in the song. And guess what? Years later, that's what George Martin did for the Love uh, uh, so, Cirque du Soleil love he performance. Was, he was copying you. He heard he that, and he's like, that, that he, guy's got it. Yeah, he must have passed by the cafe. And <laughs> <laughs> note to self. You never know. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, uh, cool. I look forward to that. Um, all right, so obviously next time we're talking about the White Album, which White a lot album, of people yeah, love. Yeah. We are going to skip... Of us uh, Magical Mystery. Oh, that's a good question. Is that an album? In my heart of hearts, I don't think it, I think of it as. I, as an I don't even consider it to release a record. Yeah. I guess you could consider it as an album, but we're not going to. Uh, I'll take a look at it. And maybe yeah. if there's something. I, I mean, I, Strawberry I, Fields or Penny Lane are great yeah, to look exactly, at. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah, it'd be an excuse. But those, I, again, I don't want to do the obvious ones. It would be like doing Day in the yeah. Life on Sgt. Pepper's. It's like it's too obvious. Right, right, right. Let's do the non-obvious ones. Anyway, we'll think about it. If uh, people have their their uh, vote in the comment section, we might consider looking yep. at your vote. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cool. All right, James. Well, as you, as always, it was so much fun. Yeah, I, had a I great really time. enjoyed it. And happy birthday! I, I'm sure Thank I am you. with the audience and wishing you happy 64th. 64 more to come. When I get I can't. No, I cannot. No, sing. it's. Uh, but oh, da, 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 da. I think that song was written more for me than you, really. <laughs> well, you shave that, don't you? Well, yeah, but I, 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 wouldn't, ha- I wouldn't have a hell of a lot if I. Oh uh, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We won't go into that. No. no. <laughs> Sorry, James. Well, I have a couple decades uh, to, to get there, about but I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> anyway, all right. Happy birthday, and we'll see you again Thank next you. month. All right. See you next time.